This program is made possible in part by the generous support of L. Diane Bernard of the Heller Bernard Fund. Like all great love affairs, the relationship between New York City and the LGBT community has been very, very dramatic. Lots of people think it starts in 1969, right here in front of the Stonewall Inn. But New York has a long, long history with issues of gender identity, sexuality, and image dating way before that. It's a central part of our city's past that should not remain hidden. We are a significant part of the map, a part of the very concrete of New York City. And that's a legacy that we carry forward every day. In his book, Stepping Out, Hunter College professor Daniel Hurwitz explores the architecture of New York's gay past, starting all the way back in 1703. CUNY TV producer Lisa Beth Kovitz caught up with Daniel uptown at the Historical Society. This is you, Lisa These are great, all these terrific picture portraits of Ben Franklin and Aaron Burr. Thomas Jefferson, as in Hamilton, and who is this gentleman? This is who I wanted you to see. This is Edward Hyde, Lord Cornbury as he was known, who was the governor of New York at the turn of the 1700s. And the rumor said that in order to demonstrate his authority from the Queen, Cornbury often appeared, as he appears in this painting, dressed like a woman. He would open the assembly, he would parade along the ramparts of the fort in a gown because he said that was the best way to embody the authority of the queen. I think it's really interesting that the New York Historical Society chooses to hang his portrait here amongst the great forefathers of the country. Yeah, I think in part what it indicates is how great is the New York Historical Society. But it indicates, I think, that we're not afraid about this part of our history that at least here in New York, we're not hiding this history. We're interested in it, it's part of the past and we want to understand it better. And I think, also I think what the painting of Cornbury reminds us is that in this country, we have a long history that's full of fascinating variety about expression of gender, about sexual behavior that we don't necessarily imagine was part of our past, but in fact was. I'd love to show you more of that past, if you'll allow me. For years in the wake of Stonewall, activists tried to create a community center in the hope of lifting gay and lesbian life out of bar culture and finding a new way to organize people around other issues. The LGBT community center started in the mid-1980s. Now it's host to all kinds of LGBT organizations and activities, including reading groups, dance clubs, and parenting support. It's a place where people go to find help and camaraderie. And as the center grew, political awareness and activism grew with it. The center became the home base for two important political groups in this city. In the late 80s, ACT UP, the AIDS activist organization was born here. And ACT UP, as we know, changed the way AIDS was responded to in this country. We'd seen almost a decade of the federal government ignoring the AIDS crisis, the Reagan administration, and ACT UP successfully demanded that the government pay attention. And out of ACT UP, we saw Queer Nation born here as well. And Queer Nation started to raise questions about who was gay and couldn't we have a broader agenda for what were the rights and the types of people that we were fighting for. And we saw really the whole queer identity movement come out of the center as well. So there was a lot of political momentum that was born here. In your book, um, Bohemian Los Angeles. I love that book. <laughs> you talk a little bit more specifically about um, Bohemian communities coming together. Yeah, the book really focuses on what I think of as the Greenwich Village of Los Angeles. And in that community were also these homosexually active men and women who started to say both, wow, look at the artists, they're expressing their emotions. That seems to matter. Well, my emotions seem important as well, my desires. And at the, on, at the same time, looking at these racial minority groups and saying, hmm, I'm oppressed. I'm, I'm part of a group that's isolated because of somehow who I am. 
I need to follow their lead politically. And so out of what they learned from these artists and leftists, you saw the birth, really, of gay politics in the country, which, although we're in New York, was actually born in L.A. I want to go upstairs to take a look at just an absolute celebration in art. Let's go take a look. Okay, good. So this is the Keith Haring bathroom in the LGBT center, a room full of amazing uh, and sometimes physically impossible images created in 1989. In the midst of the AIDS crisis. Right, I think one of the things that's extraordinary about these murals is to remember that, that in a time when people were increasingly afraid of having sex and what would happen to you and getting sick and Keith Haring was sick when you know, with AIDS when he painted this. And here he is saying, sex is great, sex is pleasure, let's continue to be sexually active and alive. Figure out a way to do it that's safe, but continue to have fun. And I think that's so powerful because for so many, particularly gay men, they thought of themselves as gay because of how they had sex. And if in the AIDS crisis you were supposed to stop having sex, then what did it mean to still be gay? And Keith Haring's here saying, keep at it. Keep living, keep having a good time. We're at La Mama because La Mama is one of a handful of places where experimental theater was really born in New York City in the 60s and 70s when gay characters, performers, and writers came out of the closet and took to the stage. For the gay creative community, just telling our stories honestly and openly was considered experimental. Artists like Tom Ian, Charles Stanley, and John Vaccaro took the opportunity that La Mama founder Ellen Stewart provided and use the theater to narrate our lives. And of course, La Mama was where a teenage drag queen named Harvey Firestein got his start as a writer. Harvey was doing groundbreaking work at La Mama and other places where experimentation was encouraged. It was the birth of the alternative theatrical movement. There already was Broadway and big brassy productions for tourists. And down here at La Mama, Ellen Stewart encouraged any kind of off-the-wall uh, pushing of the envelope, no matter how zany and crazy, because you have to go too far to know how far you can go, and in searching for something that's not on the beaten path, people found some brilliant stuff, and Harvey was in the center of it. And it's interesting to see how Harvey Firestein, through the years, has become more and more mainstream and helped to push gay culture more towards the masses, but while maintaining his edge. On Broadway and Hairspray, for which he won the Tony, there he is in drag again. This is another subversive role for Harvey. With a lot of elasticity, he's managed to juggle all these uh, sort of different hats that he wears, but he's always been sort of a gay beacon and somebody who's fought for things that even I at the time criticized. I thought, oh, why do gays want to have children and be in banal relationships like straight people have? Which is part of the storyline in Torch Song Trilogy. Yeah. And I actually criticized him for that at the time, and I had to eat crow later and say, you were right. Whether each gay person wants that or not, it's still something worth fighting for. What's interesting is that if you look at the history of Broadway theater at the same time, the 70s into the 80s, you see shows like A Chorus Line, created by Michael Bennett, that features gay characters. Or a show like La Cage, which really had at the center a gay relationship. So in a way, it really seems like Harvey's rise is part of this larger shift, is part of this mainstreaming that's happening in gay theater or in the theater world as a whole. Well, there are a lot of gays in the theater, let's face it. So for them to not address gay issues and gay characters would be absurd. But in the old days of Tennessee Williams and William Inge, a lot of times they would write coded characters. Blanche Dubois, some people feel, is a man in a woman's body so is everybody in the Glass Menagerie. Uh, and when Tennessee did confront homosexuality, it was often in the form of a tortured person who either was eaten alive or had a breakdown. Uh, some say that might be a good message to show that these were closeted people who should have been more comfortable with their sexuality. I think it wasn't until later, and Harvey was a big part of this, that you could have a gay character who's just human. Being gay is just part of who he is and doesn't have to be a victim, doesn't have to be a tragic character. What was the significance of seeing those gay characters on stage? Well, for the audience, it's very meaningful to see gay people up there as part of the mosaic of characters that are represented, but not in a way where the gayness is trumpeted with every word and not in a way where, it, where it's an old stereotype. I don't think anyone creates theater, especially on Broadway, to improve the world. 
I think they do it to make money and people finally realize there's a huge gay market and there's a huge market of people sympathetic to gay people. And even something like Mamma Mia, which is just sort of a touristy confection, made sure to have a gay revelation in there, which is very pro-gay. And it's the only thing I liked about the whole show. <laughs> uh, so that it does end up kind of maybe opening minds at the same time as they're opening people's wallets. Entertainment has always been about money. So what changed in society to allow this, this, this renaissance? Society changed. Gay people became more visible. We're not hiding in the shadows anymore. Uh, as gay people came to the forefront and there was more gay visibility in the media and more people were out, it was impossible for playwrights and other kinds of writers to ignore the gay market. The Stonewall Inn is a legendary bar, a New York landmark that still runs on Christopher Street just east of 7th Avenue. In the summer of 1969, at a very typical rate of a gay bar, that night when the police kicked everyone out and arrested the people who worked here and a handful of drag queens and other customers, the people who got kicked out resisted the police. This time they fought back. Daniel, I would love to introduce you to Andrea Weiss, a documentary filmmaker of, of international acclaim and the head of the CCNY film program. With her partner, Greta Schiller, Andrea's company, Jezebel Productions, has produced some amazing films such as Sweethearts of Rhythm, Paris Was a Woman, and she was also the research director on Before Stonewall. Andrea, what was that like doing that research? Well, it was interesting because when we made the film, there was no LGBT community. There was no term like that. There was no um, subject heading to look up in an archive, you know, homosexuality, gay life, anything like that. And so in conventional film archives, where you would go as a documentary filmmaker to look for archive footage, the only categories we had were categories like perversion and sometimes police records from the 50s, but perversion, where you found experts talking about perversion, meaning homosexuality. And imagine, you know, um, say 50 years ago, a group of gay people sitting in a room actually wondering whether or not they were mentally ill. In light of this, how important are images? Uh, to the community? I think they're crucial. I mean, you see how important it was for lesbians to grab onto any image that could be read as a lesbian image, as some kind of affirmation. And I think it was very powerful affirmation, those images. I mean, they read onto the images of the great movie stars, that they were lesbian, whether or not they were lesbian, if there was a lesbian scene in one movie, or something that could be read as a lesbian scene. They were taken on by lesbian audiences as almost like a guidepost, like how to live for who they were, you know, how to dress, how to look, how to, you know, smoke your cigarette, whatever. Those, they took on huge significance, and I think um, it was because there was such a dearth of them, um, each one became so important. I think, though, also for gay men, so many of the early public images were of effeminate men, and I think that always created a kind of tension, that these were the images you could recognize or read as gay, and yet many of these men said, well, that's not me, I'm not effeminate. Well, now, as we're talking about image, um, the Stonewall Inn here on Christopher Street has in many ways become the image of the beginning of the LGBT uprising. Um, and yet we know that, that nothing happens out of nothing. There was all kinds of things happening before. What is it about the events that happened here that became so significant to the culture? It's a great question. I think in part, as you suggested, there was gay political activism certainly quite explicitly starting in 1950 with Harry Hay and Mattachine, first in Los Angeles, but then across the country. So two decades of gay political activism before Stonewall. But Stonewall had a kind of sexy violence almost to it, where protesters didn't just pick it in their suits and ties in front of the White House, which we'd seen in the early 60s with very nicely handwritten signs saying the federal government should protect the rights of homosexuals. Protesters were out here on Christopher Street, you know, throwing bricks and bottles at the cops and chasing the cops as much as the cops were chasing them. And so I think that felt like, or that looks like, what a revolution should be. Of course it helps that the name of the bar was Stonewall, which kind of means resistance. Well, I mean, what if it were the rawhide? It just wouldn't have that, you know. 
we have self-esteem and we're not going to be pushed around. And that was true at Stonewall. It was people who were not willing to be harassed, intimidated, arrested, uh, treated as second-class citizens anymore, and were willing to fight back and risk their own bodies to do that. I was told by the guy that had brought me here that if the police come in, you separate immediately because you could be arrested at that time for just dancing with another man. Knowing the history of resistance like Stonewall, I think is very important because it encourages us to, to resist in various ways in the present. My clearest memory is of the riot police standing uh, facing the, the square from the intersection of Waverly Place and Christopher. There are these big guys standing with um, uh, shields, you know, clear plastic shields and light blue helmets with visors on them. And I watched uh, this, the, the guys form this kick line and they were doing like the Rockettes, you know, at the police with their big clunky shoes and their like lovely lacy floaty clothes. That kick line is one of the celebrated moments. Oh my of God! The why, why George Siegel didn't didn't do that? You know, three right. drag queens facing off against a riot cop. That would be a sculpture to, to I celebrate. Think about that moment, you think about the incredible courage to be staring down these beefy guys and sort of yeah, yeah, in no, your okay. chorus line mode. The next week, and it started over again, but not to a big extent. And that's when John Lindsay, the mayor of New York went on the air and told the police out of the village. Mayor Lindsay refused to um, issue a gay rights executive order. So Arthur Bell and I went into his office when he was running for uh, president and said we had an appointment with uh, Ronnie Eldridge, who was then managing his campaign. And Ronnie came out, opened the door, and said, I don't have an appointment with you. And at that point, dozens of people came out of the elevator, and we took over Lindsay's offices and we handcuffed ourselves to his desk. It was a civil rights action against oppression, and um, I think that paved the way for so many people like myself to sort of much more easily stroll into Manhattan and be gay. Forty years ago, right outside, Stonewall jump-started and continued a revolution. <laughs> years ago, Claire and I decided to leave our husbands for each other. Here we are at the Gay Pride Parade, and we have just seen in order uh, gay cops, followed by the Stonewall veterans, and now passing us is the Gay Firemen's League. Daniel, how did we come so far? from the quiet protest of 1979 to this extravaganza. It's incredible, right? I was just thinking as the cops went by, I was thinking the cops are the people we were fighting with 40 years ago. They were the, they were the enemy, and now they're part of the community. I think that's what happened over the last 40 years, is that a small group of activists who were determined and pushed hard slowly convinced other people to join them. You know, they were saying one of the chants when there was the first anniversary march in 1970 was out of the closets into the streets. And they were marching a few thousand maybe at the most up 6th Avenue trying to convince people, get with us, join this join this effort to secure equal rights for us. And that effort to secure equal rights turned into a recognition at some point, we're a community and we should be out there every year celebrating ourselves and having a party for ourselves. And that's what this is. What's interesting is nobody would say that the activist efforts of 40 years ago are done. Nobody would say, we've got equal rights, right? They're, they're fighting in Albany right now. They're shutting down the state without even saying, gay people can get married. So it's clear the agenda is still long. But at the same time, somewhere along the way, people said, nonetheless, look at all of us. You know, there is the parents of gay uh, men and women. There, there are the gay student groups. There are the gay religious groups. They're all out here saying, 
we're together. It's uh, a great big party for civil rights. Yeah, we're a movement. We're moving down the avenue, but we're trying to move forward as well. And we're proud of what we've done, and we recognize there's a lot of work ahead. A great big party for civil rights. <laughs> Let's go join it. Yes. <laughs> Get off of here, not there. You know, a lot of people are fighting for our rights today. So everybody in unison, but they were chanting that night. My job is good. It's a beautiful sunny day. God has smiled. I'm crying once again. Yeah, we're lucky about that. What do you think? It's the 40th anniversary of Stonewall. What do you think New York signifies for gay Americans? Well, it's the birthplace of our gay rights movement. It's where everything changes, and change is supposed to happen here first. A little behind the eight ball on marriage equality, but I'm pushing as hard as I can to fix that. And what do you think? Are we going to catch up? I'm getting married by the end of the year here you in New are. York. Yes, That's I am. Plan. All right. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. Happy Pride. Happy Pride to you. What do you think of the parade as a civil rights statement? I think it's a very strong statement because we're all here together and we're all just having fun making our statement. Woo! When you look at what's going on in the country today as it relates to marriage equality, it's very, I think, important to remember what happened 40 years ago and why it's almost necessary every day to realize that this is such a human rights issue right here in this country, right here in New York. And I think it's playing out today in this parade. There's an energy, there's, a, 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 I think, a real sense that we've got to pass some major legislation, we've got to do it now. It feels like people are excited, but you feel like people are also angry or impatient? I think they're going to channel some of that anger, some of that impatience to real political change. And I think that elected officials who are not making this a priority, who think they can dodge this, I think are making a big political error. And I think you can see it and sense it at this point more than any other time in the history of the movement. Happiness and peace for everyone. Equality and just joy, like the way it should have been for years. Thank you. What do you think Stonewall 40 means for New York City? Well, it's a tremendous milestone. You know, this was the birthplace of the modern civil rights movement, a place where, let's keep walking, we're not long, far from here, people said enough was enough. And it's a very important uh, moment to remember and commemorate. But what's as important is to note all the things we haven't yet accomplished yes. and to use today to re-energize ourselves for the struggles that remain. You know, we had hoped this parade would be a bit of a wedding march, and it's not. So we have to keep that fight going and numerous other ones. What do you think? You're an out lesbian, head of the city council. How important is that in the history of New York and the country? You know, I think it's very important for all communities who have not historically been in leadership positions in government or corporate life or academia to achieve uh, levels in all of those areas. And I'm incredibly indebted to the community for the really tremendous and unflagging support they've always given me. Well, I know we're all very proud of you. Thank so you. happy Pride. Thank you, happy Pride. Thanks Because so it's going to take all of us. It is. Equal rights, that's right, equal rights. Let me hear you. Equal rights. We've been fighting for so long. For so, so long. Now, 50 years ago, some of us were hanging out at page three, and some of us were hanging out, you know, in all those wonderful lesbian bars that were always getting raided. Um, the Duchess, oh, yeah. and then we run out the back door of the Duchess. And there are people here, there are stars here, and theater people here, and historians, and activists, and wonderful people, Jonathan Ned Katz. And I'm going to introduce only one other person, but I mean, you, you've met each other, and you're talking to each other. And I just want to say, we have had a really wonderful run. And we really have changed the world. We have really changed.